everyone. We're uh, here to talk about Keystone Advanced Authentication. Um, I'm Nathan Kinder. It's Steve Martinelli. We will give you introductions of who we are. <laughs> um, I'm an engineering manager at Red Hat, responsible for Keystone, um, Barbican, and other identity and security related products. Uh, upstream, for OpenStack, I'm a member of the OpenStack security group. So if you've seen a lot of the OpenStack security notes, I publish those. You might know me from there. And I contribute to Keystone when I get time to do so. so. I'm Steve Marnelli, and Nathan's being a bit uh, modest. He's an LDAP <laughs> guru. That's why I put that in there. Um, I'm a software developer at IBM. I work uh, pretty much only 100% upstream code on Keystone, OpenStack client, and any other project that really needs help. I've been contributing since the uh, Grizzly release. So just a quick kind of overview of the agenda. Um, we're going to do some level setting and talking about what Keystone does, um, what you're probably familiar with, and how you probably use it today. Um, start to go over some of the features, at least at a high level of federation and things, trying not to duplicate things you may have heard from all the other talks already. Um, but then look at how you can actually use the functionality to do more advanced cases that are possible today. So you know, using Kerberos in your environment, for example. Um, you know, how federation and how WebSSO actually works underneath things. Because with an understanding of that, you can see how you can start to plug in all sorts of different authentication methods which might fit in your environment. So uh, yeah, Keystone in two minutes or less, because hopefully if you're here under the advanced authentication methods in Keystone, you hopefully know what Keystone already is. Uh, it provides uh, I Authentication, authorization, audit, and identity mechanisms for OpenStack. It's OpenStack's identity service. Um, you know, it has some federation capabilities right now, which were highlighted in the keynote and a few other talks. And the big factor is that it's actually used by all the other OpenStack services. Um, so if you're trying to, you know, uh, create a VM on Nova, you have to go through uh, you have to go through Keystone first. And um, just a quick note about the Identity API versus Keystone. I like to always put this chart in there. Uh, they're not the same thing. You know, there's the Identity API version 2, which is, I think most people are, is what most people are familiar with. Then there's uh, version 3, which is being actively worked on. We always get this question on IRC. Uh, you know, how can I upgrade from Keystone 2 version 2 to Keystone version 3? But it's not really the case. Uh, Keystone supports both at the same time. Uh, there's just different API specs. Um, the big differences between version 3 and version 2 are with version 3 you have concepts of groups, domains, and federation capabilities. And as a result of those federation capabilities, we encourage everyone to start using um, Keystone under Apache or another HTTPD server instead of running it under Eventlet. Eventlet was great for like proto uh, it served its purpose. Let's go up. Go and move on to Apache now. Yeah, and a lot of what we're going to talk about requires you to run an Apache. So it's not even a should. It's a must for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, and pretty much everything that we're going to cover is v3 related. Anyway, identity sources. There's a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, SQL, LDAP, and we'll get into the more advanced ones in a minute. But really quickly, for the SQL ones, you're basically storing your identities in Keystone. Keystone is going to fire up a database table, just like it has database tables for um, you know, ha your roles and groups and uh, projects. Um, but it's also going to have one for identity sources. So you're going to be storing your users in a Keystone database, which is kind of less than ideal. Because if you're already in an enterprise environment, you're going to have an LDAP in there anyway. So you're kind of duplicating your effort at that point. On top of that, Keystone is not an identity. It should not have to be an identity provider. You shouldn't need, you know, password enforcement of, you know, we don't really, we don't really want to get into that game. We want to support OpenStack and the use cases of OpenStack and the other services. We don't want to have to be worried about password rotation, or, uh, you know, just things like that. Um, and yeah, but. On the plus side, though, it is, it is really easy to set up, and it's great for development and test, and it had its time. But now it's on to more advanced things, such as LDAP. Yeah, so as Steve said, with LDAP, I mean, typically most enterprises that are trying to set up like a private cloud, you're going to have LDAP of some sort. You're going to have Active Directory. You're going to have Free IPA, Open LDAP, 389 Directory Server, 
one of the many. Um, you already have accounts that are used for other things. You want to just allow those users that already exist to actually use your OpenStack cloud. Um, so basically, getting away from SQL, um, not having another identity silo, and just hooking into what exists already. So Keystone talking to LDAP should be just like your mail server, anything else that's using LDAP. Um, it's pretty basic. I covered this at the last summit in terms of what Keystone does against LDAP. It's really just doing binds for authentications and very basic user and group information lookup. Um, this is assuming you're only storing identity in LDAP, not assignment data, which is in SQL and should stay there. You'll see that in some of our other slides as well. Um, so in terms of writes, what Keystone actually needs to be able to do in LDAP, it needs a pretty unprivileged user. It doesn't, it's not an administrator of LDAP. You really shouldn't be doing writes against LDAP and user management through Keystone. You have existing provisioning for LDAP. Leave that in place. Manage your group membership and everything there. Have Keystone just consume it. So a pretty unprivileged account is all that's required there. Yeah, Keystone kind of acts like a proxy in some, some regards, and you're just kind of passing the credentials along to LDAP. It kind of yeah. acts like any other application would, like an email server or web application that's also using LDAP. Which is a good kind of negative point as well, which isn't spelled out on this slide, though, is users are giving their password over to Keystone, and it funnels it through to LDAP. Um, so in terms of advanced authentication mechanisms, it, it really isn't. It's really pretty basic. Um, but it's a step in, in the right direction. But you know, you're, you're essentially allowing Keystone to get passwords in. It's a potential for a man in the middle to sniff that and use it for something. And one of the other implications is that um, if you are, we do actually allow write access to LDAP. And if you are doing this, you're actually storing a password in the Keystone configuration file, which is another, you know, if someone actually gets into your network, they can see your file and they can see the password there, and all of a sudden they can start writing to your LDAP, which is a huge security hole. Yep. So. so SQL and LDAP, this is a really common request from a lot of people I talk with. They want to use LDAP. They do not want to put their OpenStack service users in LDAP. Um, usually it's not allowed. Some team manages Active Directory. They're not going to allow your OpenStack service users in there. Um, so. That's been a problem. A couple of releases ago, before you had multi backends, you weren't able to do that. And this is a big pain point for people. So people want both. So with multiple backends, you know, as of Juno, Keystone added support where you can have Keystone domains, and you could tie each domain to a specific backend. Um, so it requires v3 and use of domains, which may not be what people are used to working with. Um, but it's required for this. And essentially what a lot of people want to do is at least have one LDAP domain of their regular users and to have a SQL domain which has your Nova user and your Heat user and all of that in there. Um, An assignment stays in SQL. And that's been working pretty well since Juno um, with the caveats of you have to deal with domains and the command line usage from like the OpenStack client, very, very different if you're just used to using V2 and no domains. Yeah. I think it kind of makes authentication a little bit trickier, yep. but it still satisfies a very important use case that a lot of enterprises were looking for because they didn't want to put uh, service accounts in their LDAP. You know, yep. we don't want to tell the LDAP administrator to create a service account called Nova yep. to bug off or something. But authentication-wise, this doesn't really change anything from what we said before. You're still giving your password over to yeah. Keystone, and it's funneling it through to LDAP, yeah. or in the case of your service users, the passwords are stored right there in the SQL database. Yeah, the only change to authentication is now you're actually just specifying the domain. Yep. Um, and now to touch on the identity providers. This is a federation concept. Uh, so going away from LDAP, a lot of enterprises are going to already have an identity provider set up in their enterprise. Uh, think of this like you know, your Google account, your single sign-on account. Um, you want to leverage that identity provider because it's very sophisticated, has support for a lot of, uh, it's typically backed by LDAP or something else, but you don't have to actually um, see those bits. It's kind of kind of covers it all for you. And um, it's really nice because from a Keystone perspective, we just want the identity provider to handle the authentication and we'll get back a representation of the user and then we can decide from there how we want to treat that user. 
what type of authorization he has on Keystone as a result on the cloud. And um, so typically, an identity provider will speak either SAML or OpenID Connect, and those are XML-based and JSON-based, respectively. And leveraging an identity provider just kind of makes sense. It felt like the natural progression of, of, a, of a way to do things in Keystone. Yeah, and the, the images on this slide make it look like it's you know social media based essentially, but um, SAML is pretty commonly used in the enterprise. You might have something like Active Directory Federation Services or Shibboleth or whatnot. Um, so it's you know it, it's not just for hey I want to log in with Google or anything like that. Um, it has it has a good place in the enterprise really. Yeah, like specifically I know. Internally, we use uh, we use SAML for a lot of the stuff, and whenever we want to use any web application, we're going through a single sign-on experience, and that's SAML based. Yep. It's a SAML based login. So, yeah. So typically, for like your public cloud case, people might want to bring their own IDP. They have their internal LDAP. It's not exposed um, out in the public, but you have a SAML IDP, and you can basically, when you set up your account with the public cloud provider, you set up a trust relationship at that point, so you can bring your own accounts there and they don't have to be managed in the public cloud. So uh, some of the use cases as to when you want to use these identity sources. You want to use SQL if you're just kind of prototyping stuff, you, you know, developing and testing, you just want to do something really quickly. It's probably the least amount of time to set up. It's really handy that way. I use it whenever I'm playing around with DevStack and I, and I don't need to make any changes to the identity, uh, to, to the identity related code. I'm testing something else. Uh, LDAP you want to use if it's already in place in your in your enterprise, um, and you know using the service accounts there. If you can actually create it in your LDAP, it's easier. But I'm not too sure how many enterprises would be happy about that. You can. Some people do. It depends yeah. if it's the same team that owns the LDAP server that owns the cloud. Exactly. Um, yeah. Most cases, people don't want to. But yeah, normally LDAP have been is, forced to in the past. <laughs> yeah. Normally, LDAP is a completely different team that's running it, so at that point, it yeah. becomes messy. Uh, with multiple backends, that's what's preferred for most enterprises, so exactly what we were just saying. You know, you can't put the service users there, so you want to split them. Um, so this has been, since Juno, even before then, it seems to be the most desirable uh, state for people running private clouds, is, is this split backend approach. Yeah, yeah even in uh, pre-Juno, there was actually some folks who had actually just created their own, they called it the hybrid, the hybrid driver, yeah. that actually did this, but it wasn't domain based, I believe. It was fallback based. Yeah. yeah. And then an identity provider, you want to use that if you want to take advantage of the uh, federation related features in Keystone. Or, you know, you have a non LDAP identity source. I know there's some support for Active Directory in Keystone, but it's not as good as, say, LDAP, because LDAP actually has really, really great support in Keystone. Or if you're using something like MongoDB to hold your identities, that's uh, not there. Um, and just basically, yeah, if you, you really want to take advantage of the federation related well, code. And, and one other thing, we'll see it when we go through the diagrams of how the flows work, but with federation, you are never providing the user's credential to Keystone. Yeah. So that's huge, because Keystone can't then impersonate the user to some other service that might be using LDAP. Yeah, we really want to get away from seeing your password. Yep. Uh, auth plugins. Um, Keystone actually supports a lot of different authentication plugins to interact with those identity sources. Most basic one is the password plugin. I think this is, if anyone spun up DevStack, this is the one most people are actually used to. Uh, you essentially go to Keystone with your password, gives you back a token, and you get a, you use that token, the other OpenStack services like Compute or Swift. Um, sorry, storage. And, uh, but the token will eventually expire, and like we said earlier, Keystone is now seeing your password, and if you're using SQL, it's storing it in, in a hash, or if you're using LDAP, it's just passing it through to the LDAP server. And um, one quick note about the, uh, the authentication is that if you provide a project scope, you're gonna get a project scope token, and if you don't provide that, you're gonna get a unscoped token, which comes into play a little bit later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The token is very similar. Let's say you already have a token, uh, you've authenticated and it's nearing its, its expiry time. You can actually use that one to get a new token with a new expiry time. Um, or, like I said earlier, 
if you specify a, if you don't specify a project, just the username and password, you're just going to get an unscoped token back. And we use this token authentication plugin to actually allow a user to see what projects they have access to based on their roles. And then um, from there, they can get a scope token, which helps in tenancy. Yeah, I mean, think of the Horizon case when you go into Horizon and you have a whole list in the drop down of what projects you actually have a role granted on. And selecting between those, it has to get a different token every time you make a different selection, basically, um, because the token is scoped to something. So you can, instead of prompting for a password every time you hit that drop down, it's changing tokens. And then the uh, external plugin, it's actually going to use, uh, uh, it takes advantage of a lot of Apache HTTP servers. Uh, it's where a remote user environment variable is set. And this is kind of where an identity is being passed forward. You've already authenticated with something else, and you're saying, sending an identity over it. But the same concept stays. You're going you're gonna to get back a token, and you're going to use a token somewhere else. Yep. Yeah, and there are a few different plugins, actually, than just one external plugin. There are a couple different types, because um, you can have it scoped to a domain, for example, and set remote domain. But essentially, as Steve said, it's you have the web server that's running Keystone. It's handling all of the authentication external to Keystone. And Keystone trusts the web server it's running in to say, look, I know this is who I say it is. Here, just go do what you need to do. Yeah, it's a trusted source <laughs> of identities. So. So with Kerberos, um, I'll give a, an overview of Kerberos if you're not familiar with it, so you know the benefits, and then we'll get into how, how it all works. Um, so Kerberos is a single sign-on authentication system, um, both for browser-based, um, if you're using something like GSS API Negotiate, um, or for command line-based clients as well. Um, so it's based on symmetric keys, and the concept is very similar to Keystone, or I should say Keystone is very similar to Kerberos since it was partially modeled after that. Um, users get tickets, and they present that ticket when they're accessing a service, much like you get a token from Keystone and you present that to Nova or some other service to, to actually be authorized to use it. Um, these tickets are limited lifetime. By passing the tickets over, um, you're never sending passwords over the wire. And actually with Kerberos, even to get your initial ticket, you're never sending a password over the wire. The only time a password sent anywhere is when you set your initial password for the whole Kerberos ecosystem. Um, so in this case, Keystone never has knowledge of a user's password. It can't impersonate the user to any other service whatsoever. Um, the terminology, and we're going to see these in some diagrams. So the KDC is the Kerberos Key Distribution Center. Um, a TGT is a ticket granting ticket. Um, so that's used to get other tickets, which are called service tickets. A service ticket is good for talking to one specific service. Um, so a lot of infrastructures already have Kerberos, and you may not even know you have it. Active Directory has Kerberos internally. FreeIPA has it as well. Um, or of course, you could set up a KDC yourself. Um, so we'll go through the flow and see how, how this looks from Keystone's perspective. So. When a user initially authenticates, typically this is they come in in the morning and they log in to their Kerberos infrastructure, they send an auth request to their KDC. And they get back a ticket granting ticket. That ticket granting ticket is only good for getting other service tickets from your KDC. And so later that user wants to go and access their cloud. They need to authenticate and get a Keystone token. They pass their TGT to the Kerberos um, KDC and say, I want to talk to the Keystone service. And they'll get back a service ticket. And that service ticket is specific to this Keystone instance. And so then when the user goes to hit Keystone's auth URL, and they have that ticket, we're running an Apache, and we have something like mod auth cur, or it could be mod auth GSS API. That handles all of the Kerberos side of things. So Keystone itself hasn't done anything yet. It figures out who the user is and then it's upsetting remote user. That gets passed through to Keystone. Keystone can do all of its lookups of what roles does this person have on what projects, and it gives back a Keystone token. So what's nice about this is all of the complexity in this chart isn't around Keystone itself. Keystone doesn't even really know that it was Kerberos. Um, so you can plug other things in here. You can use X509 client certs. 
by using something like um, mod SSL. And as long as it, you can do your mapping there in the Apache configuration and pass remote user through, Keystone's none the wiser. It doesn't care. And um, now we're going to touch on the uh, federated identity portions, which seeing some familiar faces in the audience, I think you've been to some of the earlier talks around this topic, so I'll try and go at it a little bit quicker. Um, but basically what you want to do is, again, you want to set it up within Apache, and you want to use an existing identity provider um, and use and authenticate with that identity provider. And then you want to have Keystone acting as a, just another service provider and, um, under, and run it under Apache and then install uh, different Apache plugins such as mod auth shib or mod auth open IDC, something like that that can actually take advantage and, and understand what the identity provider is saying back to you. And a quick note about the terminology like we've already talked about is uh, an identity provider in Keystone terms is, um, is a trusted source of identities. You trust him. If he comes back saying, you know, this is Nate Kinder from Red Hat. He has the role of manager. You trust him. You trust that this is not faked because you trust the identity provider. A service provider is something that's already consuming, that consumes um, the identities. And the assertion is a way of representing the user. So if it's JSON based, uh, if it's OpenID Connect, it's going to be JSON based. If it's SAML, it's XML based. And over here, you can see the flow that's actually going on here. Um, we tried to keep the images as similar as possible. But essentially, the user is actually going to hit a, a separate auth URL that is protected in Apache. And as a result, they're going to go directly to the Apache module. In this case, it's mod ship. It could actually be mod open IDC. It could be, and then on the left side would be an open ID connect identity provider. It doesn't have to be a, a SAML provider there. But moving forward, um, the, since it's a protected path, you're going to go right to ModShib. ModShib is configured to actually talk to the identity provider. So it's going to go there. And the user's going to authenticate with their identity provider, and it's going to return a SAML assertion. At that point, the assertion, and this is when it actually goes back to Keystone. Uh, so ModShib will actually forward that assertion over to Keystone. So it, and that assertion is a representation of the user. So it's going to say, Nate Kinder, role manager, organization Red Hat. And then from there, based on the mapping that you've created, um, it's gonna, Keystone is going to slot that user into a group, and it's actually going to pick out the username from whatever property you choose. And um, based on the group that he gets put into, then he'll have a role on a project or on domain, and from there he'll be able to actually get a token. Yeah, and the, the important thing here as well is the assertion is actually being transformed into environment variables by mod ship right. or mod OIDC or any of the modules that we're talking about. So again, from Keystone's perspective, it just gets a set of environment variables that it has to be able to parse and figure out what to do with the user. Um, and that goes through mapping, which I yeah. think is up next. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. Yep. And there's the whole mapping engine kind of, in, kind of happening right there. Um, so like Nathan said, the, the assertion, was, assertion or open ID claim is actually going to come in as environment variables as it, it, within the request. And you can see those on the left side over there, bottom left. Then based on the mapping rules that you configure, which are based on a per IDP and protocol basis, um, you will then output a set of uh, a way to represent that external user. Um, so I guess in this case, he's going to be put into a group um, called oh, just ABC123, apparently. We're not creative. And um, you can see that the OS Federation, it's going to actually and that's part of the, to the token part that he eventually gets back from Keystone, is it's going to have a specific portion called OS-Federation, which shows that he's coming from an external source, an, an IDP. So you're going to have the, uh, the identity provider name based on how you configured it in Keystone, my IDP, the protocol that was used, and the groups that he now has access to. Additionally, the ID and name can actually be specified in the mapping on top there. So under local, uh, local is a way of how you want to represent the user, the external user, in local Keystone terms. So that's how you're going to represent them 
uh, represent the user's name, ID, domain locally, as well as what groups he has access to. Yeah, so all this is also specific to the OS Federation extension. I've seen people do some kind of odd half approaches as well. So if we look at the old external auth approach that we talked about where you just get remote user come through, there's no reason you couldn't use SAML to just set that. Maybe the assertion from your IDP doesn't provide any grouping information or anything of real use other than the user's identity. You can still have the users exist within Keystone, but just use a SAML or an OIDC module and not use OS Federation yeah. and get single sign-on at least. And so there's some interesting kind of hybrid approaches that you can do just by using external auth there without doing the full-blown federation. Yeah. So you can also take OS federation and do some really interesting things with it. So um, it's useful really any time that you want to externalize all of the identity information and have it be provided. Um, so federated LDAP is an interesting approach as well. It's not really federation. Um, but there's not really a better name for it either. <laughs> so Keystone right now with the LDAP driver has to deal with all of the logic of how to talk to the LDAP server, um, deal with all of the LDAP operations, which it may do a good job of performing. It may not do a very good job of performing from an optimization standpoint. All of that can be offloaded to the underlying platform, which knows how to use LDAP for like system authentication uh, via SSSD, uh, which is System Security Services Daemon. So, Basically, we can take all of that LDAP logic and not use it at all for Keystone. Um, SSSD itself is responsible for doing authentication um, against remote identity sources. So typically against LDAP servers, knows all about Active Directory, free IPA, any generic LDAP server. Um, it handles caching of lookups, which Keystone doesn't. So you have fault tolerance. The LDAP server is down during the cache interval your user can still authenticate to Keystone at that point. Um, it's also going to be much faster with cache results. It has failover for fault tolerance. Um, so lots of nice features that are very rich from an LDAP perspective. Um, and so for integration points with SSSD, for a long time it's had PAM and name service switch integration um, for traditional Unix Linux type authentication. But we added a Dbus interface for applications to be able to query it through Dbus. Uh, and the main usage of this is an Apache module we wrote called Mod Lookup Identity. And what Mod Lookup Identity does is if you have some other module do authentication and set remote user, Mod Lookup Identity can take that and ask SSSD for the information associated with that user. What groups is this user a member of? Anything you'd get with like a get end request on a system typically. And then expose those to a web application as a set of environment variables. Um, so if you take mod auth anything and mod lookup identity and you have an LDAP server, it looks exactly the way that Federation does from Keystone's perspective. So if we go back to you know, our Kerberos case where we had that for authentication and I already had my service ticket and I passed that to mod auth curb, it figures out setting a remote user, mod lookup identity is invoked by Apache it calls down into SSSD. That has all of the, the knowledge of where the LDAP server is, does the lookup, and provides all of your variables there. And so from Keystone's perspective, it still doesn't have to have the users created, and you're using LDAP in a, in a more federated fashion there. So it really simplifies Keystone. And then you get a token back. And so that would use all the same OS federation mapping <laughs> logic as well, just for LDAP attributes. And um, touching back to the OS Federation uh, feature, one of the other uh, uh, features that we had support for in Kilo was the uh, single sign-on. So this um, goes back to uh, working with Horizon, and we had to work a lot with the Horizon team uh, during the Kilo release to get this through because we made some changes to the uh, Django OpenStack auth and, and Horizon. And uh, was, they were very supportive of that, and it was actually a, it was actually a good time to it's actually a good learning experience, put it that way. Um, and it's going to provide a classic single sign-on flow um, from a Horizon perspective. And it's important because it, 
the user is going to see something more familiar. And that's where branding comes into place. They're going to see their usual single sign-on um, single sign on login. And this is kind of what it's going to look like in a really quick uh, glimpse over here. Um, you can still uh, decide how you're going to authenticate. You don't have to go all, you don't have to always uh, select the, um, the single sign on flow. You can actually go back to using your service accounts and your username and password there. But if you do actually decide to click on to the OpenID Connect flow, which is set up in this case, you're actually going to see your uh, branded login page like this. And at which point, once you log in, uh, it'll go through the Federation dance, which we described earlier, slightly different, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. And um, you're going to actually see that the username and the roles that he has, he's actually going to be put in the groups. They have certain roles on projects. But the user ID isn't going to be, isn't going to exist in Keystone, but it's going to actually be picked up from the identity provider. So uh, similar to the OS Federation flow, and kind of similar to the, uh, to the federated one, it, you're going to have another source on the bottom here. Uh, you're going to have Horizon. It doesn't have to be in the same Apache HTTP um, as Keystone, uh, but it could be. Uh, so in this case here, the user is going to go to Horizon, which is then going to actually go to mod ship, depending on what protocol you selected, which then is going to go directly to the SAML IDP, and that's when the user has to actually log in. Once logged in, uh, they're going to forward the SAML assertion or open ID connect. It's the same, uh, same thing as in, um, in the OS Federation example. It doesn't have to depend on SAML. It could be open ID. Uh, once there, uh, the Apache module is actually going to forward the username, group member, whatever, all the attributes it's going to forward. And based on your mapping engine, what it's going to go and uh, uh, give you a token, and that token is going to have the IDP information and groups. And from there, in this case, the user is actually a browser. It's actually going to provide, uh, give that token back to Horizon, and that's how he's able to log in, because Horizon, you need to provide a token. Whereas before, I guess if you uh, actually submitted your username and password, it did this kind of, it just went straight to Keystone. Yep. And then it got the token back to, to the browser. Yeah, so before you were basically giving all of your credentials over to Horizon, and it would just get tokens and do whatever it needed on your behalf. But in this case, Horizon's really saying, go talk to Keystone, get a token, and give it back to me. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. And um, the multi-factor auth, did you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, so with multi-factor auth, there are a couple options today. There are more options that are being worked on going forward as well. Um, so, you know, typically what a lot of people are asking for with multi-factor at this point is uh, one-time password, you know, HOTP, TOTP, using a YubiKey, Google Authenticator, anything like that. Um, so today with Keystone, you can, if you're using free IPA as just even direct LDAP, you can register users for um, OTP tokens. And the LDAP bind will allow you to use an OTP token as the password, essentially. Um, and so really, is for something like Keystone, it doesn't have to have any extra support for OTP. A user has OTP enabled, and that's required for their account. They just provide that as their password, and off it goes. So it buys you, you know, some good benefits over just regular fixed passwords, of course. And the guys, some of the guys, Keystone guys from Rackspace actually have a proposal to have kind of pluggable MFA support in Keystone. And just a few quick closing statements before we go to the go through the questions, because we're kind of running tight on time. Um, you know, the point of the presentation was that Keystone is pretty flexible. Um, depending on, it, on what you have in your enterprise, it'll, there's probably a way to authenticate with Keystone. Yep. Um, and we encourage you to leverage existing identity sources. Keystone does not want to be in the IDP game. We don't want to be responsible for rotating your passwords or anything like that. Yep. And, um, you know, the clients always need a little bit of help. Um, Keystone client, OpenStack client, they need to leverage the, um, the other authentication methods a bit cleaner. Yeah, I mean, that's always the challenge is, you know, the client side pieces have to know how to provide the cred credential, whatever it is initially. Um, there, are some, there are some different plugins for, like, SAML for Federation. Um, I don't believe there's one for OpenID no, Connect yet. No, we're working yet. on it. So. Yeah, so yeah. that always seems to lag behind. That's an area where... <laughs> 
help would be appreciated, definitely. And it's funny because actually in the federation flows, because federated identities are so browser-based mm -hmm. that doing things from a command line is kind of tricky because yep. you have to ha able to be able to handle all the redirects yep. uh, kind of silently. Um, anyway, um, questions and hopefully some answers. Uh, if you could, please, if you please, could use, please the mic. use the mic. Yep. I know so, it's in the middle of the room. Since and it's I'm here first, I'm going to uh, ask a question. And since you ended up on that note about CLIs and federation protocols, yep. uh, we are here to help uh, Steve. So just so you know, Fernando's working with you. Oh, and yeah. I'll, I'll try to join him. Um, but we need that support very quickly. I think it's really important for federation to succeed. Yeah, there's been a lot of work to make authentication pluggable from the Keystone client perspective. Um, and so, you know, being able to easily write plugins for different auth types and just hook them in there is, is crucial, so. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely high on the priority list to make sure that the clients can actually consume these features. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Hi, when you use uh, orchestrations, why can't we think of 509's authentications? For orchestration, like Heat? Yeah. Uh, Heat uses Keystone Trusts, so uh -huh. it's sort of after the fact, right? So the user authenticates initially and goes to set up, uh, set up Heat. Um, they're going to have a Keystone token at that point, and Keystone Trusts are going to be created. So what's going to happen at that point is Heat itself authenticates to Keystone as its service user and executes a trust to get back a token. So it's a, it's a much different flow than end user authentication. Right, and then in that process, why uh, the, the service user cannot use a X509? Yeah, so that's some of the work that's going on right now as well. Um, one of the problems is a lot of the services over time have copied and pasted code for how they deal with authentication in Keystone, and that's all being extracted and modularized. And that's part of the, the auth plugin stuff that I was referring to as well is we're working to allow service users to use Keystone v3 and these plugins so you can say, you know, use a key tab to authenticate, use a certificate to authenticate. Yeah. Um, so there's work going on there as well. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we want to get those passwords out of files. I actually yeah. have a follow up to that. Uh, is there a timetable for the service users to be able to use v3 at all? At least in Juno, I had real issues. We're, we are hoping during the cycle, Jamie Lennox on the Keystone team has been yeah. working very hard on that. He's made a lot of progress. Um, but not in Kilo yet? No. Okay. No. Uh, another question about the mapping flow. Is there, how is the logging done when you have federation mapping? Because I guess their logging is really important to get the actual end user hash mapped to a real user. So you actually, if something goes wrong, you know who actually logged in. So, well, they're not actually mapped to a real user entity, necessarily. It's computed on the fly. Yeah. So they're mapped to groups. Um, in terms of logging of what came in from the assertion, I, I don't know if we're emitting CATF yeah, we do, for yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, we have, uh, we have notifications that are emitted uh, for every time a federated login occurs, and it'll map to the user. What's in the payload of that notification is the mapped username and the groups and the identity provider that he's coming from. Okay. We, we should look probably at if there's additional logging you need of certain values from the assertion. I don't know that we're logging that now. We don't log the, any uh, other content from the assertion. And could that be could useful. be something interesting yeah. to be able to specify you know, pieces that are used in the mapping, not the whole assertion maybe, but yeah. I know if you have it in debug yeah. mode, it's actually gonna spit out the whole assertion. So uh, you mentioned the uh, multi-factor uh, authentication. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, for example, if I'm assigned uh, two projects and uh, each of them has different security levels, uh, is it possible that uh, for one project, there's uh, one factor authentication is good enough, but for the other one, it requires uh, two factors or even more? That might be covered by what Rackspace um, was trying to work on there and because in order to do that sort of thing, you need to have knowledge that OTP is actually happening within Keystone itself. Yeah. And you'd have to flag that at the project level. I believe that they were covering that, um, but it, it's something we can check with them. Okay, yeah. cool. It sounds Thanks. like a good idea, though. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm not sure if this question is relevant to Keystone um, in terms of LDAP and backends, but 
right now, is there any kind of mechanism for a persistent kind of, of password or certificate for a VM or an instance to prove who it is so that for like logging, I want to allow that VM to securely authenticate and not have to be a token that times out. There, there have been some conversations over the last two days with some of the Barbican folks that we've been having. Um, it's not really a keystone thing, but yeah. basically being able to do something like uh, when I create a VM to inject a secret from Barbican on there, or generate and inject, okay. but have it done as like a plugin from Nova. The designs only just been like discussed in the hallways in the last day and a half so uh, okay. but there have been a couple people asking for that and then you can use that for you know basically identifying the system i think we're getting the wrap-up music uh if you want to come up we'll take the question okay. thanks thank you